Hey everyone, today we have Vince Crow, a very unique individual, and I'm excited for these next several minutes we're gonna spend together. How are you, Vince? I'm doing great. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for joining us here. For those that don't know, Vince was in our Swine Talks, and uh, it's hard to believe, but a few people from the audience didn't show up in the Swine Talks, Vince. Uh, unbelievable. That was uh, a really interesting conference. Of all the ones I've done um, virtually ever since coronavirus hit, yours was the most um, edge pushing. I thought it was a really fun one to be a part of. Yeah, you you opened that event and uh, you had the little avatar for people that want to check that talk. We actually is the only one that we have in our website, so swinetalks.com. You can watch that uh, on your uh, virtual reality. Super cool stuff. Super cool stuff. Um, Vince. Um, what 2014 so six years ago i think you were on npr and the news there said uh monsanto hired this guy to help win over millennials just share with folks your your journey so far and all the, the interesting things you've done so i grew up in small town central illinois but uh even though it was only a town of 4,500 people uh, I really knew very little about agriculture. I had friends that were um, swine, you know, raised pigs. Um, I would go out and walk beans occasionally and bale hay, but I really had no idea what farming was all about. And I definitely went the kind of cosmopolitan city route. I, I left my small town and went to uh, college and then bounced all over the world. I, I uh, became a deckhand on an ecotourism ship. I ran a camp for inner city kids. I joined the U.S. Peace Corps and uh, lived in rural Kenya and uh, just kept doing different adventures. Uh, uh, found a ship, renovated it and with my friends, I worked in public radio for a while, then studied diplomacy and uh, got a job at the World Bank where um, I ultimately um, met my wife while living in DC and then uh, moved to St. Louis. And uh, although this is kind of a circuitous route, when I was here, I was running my own communications company and I had a chance to go work for Monsanto. And uh, really, I only took the interview because I thought, well, who doesn't want to see inside of Willy Wonka's chocolate factory, this dark and scary place? Yeah. And uh, when I got the interview, I realized, wait a second, they were hiring for a position um, that that is going to go out and try and explain to people why this company is not as evil as everybody thinks that it is. And the interesting thing was I came into the company thinking maybe they were evil. And so I realized that if I took this job, I would have the chance to run around and ask people anything I wanted. And if they were as dark and as scary as everybody thought that they were, well, then I'd go write a great tell-all book. But if not, well, then you've just uncovered one of the biggest challenges in the history of humankind, which is we're growing food more bountifully than we ever have before. And yet uh, people are afraid and angry about how their food is being raised. And so I spent the next five years kind of working on that puzzle. Right. You were a director of uh, millennial engagement. Is that right? Yeah. So, and there was really no, they didn't know what that job meant. They just knew there are millennials out there that really dislike us. We want you to go out and communicate with them. I mean, this is a huge topic. Um, I think, you know, for me, for our audience, uh, pig producers and, and, um, you know, the way we connect with consumers and all those things, right? You have, uh, uh, you have transgenic, you have gene editing coming down the pipe, right? What were the biggest learnings there for you? I think uh, the biggest thing for me was when you have a new technology, even if all the people that have the science and the knowledge feel great about it, if you don't help people understand why they would want something that... Uh, they, they don't know anything at all about the value of the change, but if they don't understand it, they don't want it because it seems like danger, right? Like change is scary for people no matter what. And you can't just say we have all the science on our side because science has actually become kind of a synonym for truth with a capital T and people don't necessarily believe that. And so what they have to do is come to a reason why they should want it. And that, that was the big thing that I think was the failure in biotech ag crops because people had no no understanding of the challenges farmers were facing. And so to them, it just seemed like a change that was dangerous to them. Right. Thinking about it, digesting that. Uh, this is this is great. Um, 
when you think about, and I've been thinking about this topic for a while in the last few years, right? We have a lot of data, science, and how do you make that into a good story as well, right? Anything that you've learned on this storytelling side of things that it'll be useful for folks? You know, in the ag world, everybody has heard this idea. You should tell your story, tell your story. People need to hear your story. And that's close to being right, but it's just ever so slightly off because um, what that does is it puts farming in the role of being the hero. And what people don't realize is the stories that you get the most out of, the ones that have the biggest impact are the ones when um, the hero uh, encounters a problem that they're not capable of solving and that they've had to like overcome it in some way. And when you think about the people that are telling stories that are really effective uh, to get people to say, we don't want transgenic or we don't want uh, factory raised animals, those kinds of things, the thing that they think that they are put in the position of being the hero that has discovered there's some nefarious uh, way of, of growing crops or raising animals and that by not buying those things, they are then the hero. And so that's like, well, okay, why is that a problem? Well, if farmers are going out and telling stories, I am the hero, I am the hero, I am the hero, it doesn't relate to people. But the people that are trying to say, the the farmer over there is dangerous and scary and you know this you are the hero and the 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 way that you be the hero is that you pay more for organic or you pay more for this type of uh, animal uh, raising strategy that makes you the hero so until farmers start changing the fact that they are not the hero in the story they're the mentor that shows the consumer how to make the right choice their stories will keep getting out competed Right. What would be a practical advice for for the uh, farmers that who do have, um, you know, Instagram and, and those places? What would be what would be a good way to approach it? Do you think? I think that the best way to do it is to create knowledge gaps. You know, one of the things that people don't realize when they're talking about farming is there are things that are so basic that a person living in the city wouldn't even have the concept to know. So. When you start thinking about how you would make the case, like in my world, it was ag crops. So like, you know, um, corn and soybeans, and you might have GMOs. Well, people have no idea whether or not GMOs are good, or if you should use Roundup that goes along with the glyphosate tolerant crops. And so when a farmer goes out and says, you know, I had this land handed down to me by my parents and they had it handed down to them by their parents. It's been three generations. And the one thing that makes living on this farm possible is because we have a well. And uh, when I started thinking about the things that we were putting on the crops, I realized that the all of the water that is fed into that well comes from the land that my property, you know, you know, my crops are grown on where I spray those crops. And so when I look at what I'm going to place on those crops, I want to find the thing that is the best for my well. And because I'm going to be drinking that water. And then when you discovered glyphosate, now all of a sudden you've discovered a solution. Maybe the, the, the chemistries you were putting on there before weren't great. And now you have this better thing. So you're trying to say like, what challenge did you overcome uh, present it in a way that makes it so that the choices that you've made help people make sense of it. Because back to my original point, the, the people living in the city, it doesn't even dawn on them that you drink the water that is that is on your fields first. And that the person that is most acutely in danger by whatever they put on the crops is actually the farmer and his family. And those kind of reveal moments are the way that people come to an aha, now I know why they use glyphosate as opposed to some other crop protection tool. I love it. In your website, you, you have a, a saying there that says, uh, making complex idea uh, ideas simple uh, to understand. And I love it. And you've done a phenomenal job of that in our conference. And maybe we can touch on some of those topics, but also what other topics that... that um, you've distilled in, in over your over the years well one that i think is really interesting to the uh, swine industry is the concept of the intransigent minority and how new ideas enter a society right because we kind of have this perception that the way culture is built is just by the middle of society by the average um, Jane and Joe, right? And that, and that, you know, kind of when their tastes and their preferences change, they change slowly over time. And that's just the way things go. 
But if you go and look around at the literature about how big cultural shifts happen, like the way we eat food or the, uh, the things we'll drink, basically any major change in our culture, it happens not as a result of the people in the middle, but instead it happens by the people on the poles. And then the people on the polls that say, I believe something completely different than the people in the middle. I believe something, for example, they might say, I'm a vegan. I think we should not eat animals at all. Their entrenched position of which they won't come off of, there's no negotiating with somebody. You don't become like half a vegan. You're either are or you aren't, right? And so they push their idea and the people in the middle will say, well, you know what, maybe we should just give them a little bit of what they want because they're really loud. And if we were really loud about something, we would want this thing and then we could be negotiated with. So maybe you say, well, then we're going to have a meatless Monday. So then that moves you one step closer towards that pole. And it's all kinds of ideas like that. It's not the mass that moves culture. It's the group of people that comes and complains and will not be negotiated with um, that, a, that a man named Nassim Taleb refers to as the intransigent minority. And I think ag faces that on all sides. Right. And I wonder, we touched a little bit already when you, you, know, you mentioned on, on the story and, and how to handle some of those. Is there any other, I mean, I'm trying to think how to apply that to, to our audience events. Any, any insights? I mean, is there, on the vegan aspect, I mean, what is that trend long-term, right? But also... I'm thinking out loud here, what other things? I know one thing in my area is the self feeding where we've there's solid amount of data saying that you shouldn't be giving more feed to the sow in late gestation. You just look at their body condition is more important. And I, th I think we've been, we've been that minority for the last several years and I think we got traction. But, but anyways, long question here. Uh, any practical thing our industry can do for, from that standpoint? Well, so what I think that um, people need to know that are in the swine industry. So, for example, if you have a group of people that say, we don't want any new sow barns in this area, like we absolutely will say no. It turns out research shows that uh, the sides that show to the public that they're the most reasonable, they're the most articulate, they're always able to be calm. They understand the argument of the other side and can explain it really, really well but then also give their point of view. When you're talking about how to impact the intransigent minority, you can't add more force with force. You just have to recognize the intransigent minority is not the group you're negotiating with. You're negotiating with that group that's in the middle. And what they want to know is, do you understand the concerns of the people on the other side? Because if you do understand their, their point of view and you can show why your point of view addresses their needs, but yet they're still not happy, then you have a far better chance of winning over the, the massive middle. Did you watch the social dilemma? I'm familiar with it. Yeah. Did you watch that documentary? I mean, I've seen part of it, but not the whole thing. I mean, I'm pretty familiar with the idea well before the movie came out. Right. Because I mean, I encourage everyone to watch it because it just creates uh, that echo chamber. I think we, we talked in, in the past, right? Uh, around these kind of things, which is super interesting. I mean, I, I wonder how much of that from a social media standpoint, will be accelerating some of these uh, minority thoughts uh, like that, like vegan and other things. Uh, 100%. And the, the reason is the algorithm could be completely um, uh, neutral. It may not have a political bent. What it wants is what prompts people to push the refresh button? What prompts people to say, uh, to just sit on a page and wait for the person that's typing to, to say something back. And so what they're trying to do is to engage your passions. And so in truth, that's, I think, what's driving much of our societal conflict is that we're having the illusion of conflict. We're having this sense of watching people argue back and forth and one person say something crazy and the other person respond and it just kind of burns down. But the real, I mean, conflict is actually good to have. You should have, when a farmer is coming into a community and wants to build something, he wants to find a way to be able to interact with the community. The community should be able to say, hey, we're concerned about this, and the farmer address it. But social media does not benefit by having 
a soft engagement, a back and forth on in conflict. And so we have the illusion of conflict, which is the sparks and all the fire, but none of the feedback mechanism where people are like, oh, I see your point and I can change what I was thinking to make it get better. So we're in this kind of cloud of the illusion of conflict. Super interesting. Yes. Uh, Vince, you have... Um, uh you know, graduate degree in negotiation. Uh, and we have, ev sometimes we don't think about it, but we have negotiation every time and every day in our lives, right? If you're putting your kid to bed or whatever it is, right? So in the farm, right? Uh, dealing with uh, employees or teammates is whatever. What are some key aspects on negotiation that you think uh, everyone should know about? I think the very, the, the most basic lesson you learn in negotiations, even when you get up to graduate level negotiations, is the difference between positions and interests. So the example I could give is if we had an orange and I said, I want the orange and you said, no, I want the orange. So now if we're both arguing over positions, we really only have three options. Either I can take the orange and you get nothing. You can take the orange and I get nothing or we cut it in half and then you get half the orange and I get half the orange. Well, so the problem with that is if I was thirsty, for example, and I wanted to drink, I only got half of what I wanted. I didn't get all of what I wanted. And it turns out that if you start to zoom the camera lens back and say, well, you don't want to ask Marcio, what does he want? You want to ask, why does he want it? So it may be that you are not thirsty, that you're actually making essential oils with the rind of the, of the peel. And so you only need the peel and the inside of it is something you could throw away. Well, if I know that, then I can say, well, I'll give you 100% of the peel and you give me 100% of the juice that's in there. Now we, can, now we can find a way to come to our solutions. And so that's called finding people's interests. And if you ever find yourself saying, this is the only way I will accept a yes, that's your position. But what you really want to know is, what is it within that that I, am, that I am thinking of that I need to have that's met? And the better I can communicate my interest to the other person and the better that they can communicate what they really want. I want essential oils. I want to smell good. I want to, I'm thirsty. Whatever these things are, the better I can figure out how to answer your problems and you can figure out how to answer mine so that we both get what we want. That's super cool. I mean, something that I learned about negotiation took me a long time. It's very simple is when you think about contracts and price, the price is not that important as, uh, as much as the terms are also extremely important. Yeah. And I mean, I think that that goes with all things, right? Like if you go in and you're trying to do a salary negotiation, if you think the only thing that the employer can give you is more money for the job, as opposed to is there a way for you to get more time off? Is there a way for you to be doing responsibilities that you want that will allow your career to grow? Is there a way for you to be able to um, manage timing problems that you have? Maybe, maybe the most important thing is that you're always at your kid's baseball game. That may be more valuable to you than money. And so by being able to discuss these things or disclose what matters to you, the better somebody else can reach them. And, and that's really true of the employer trying to figure out what are the details that this person cares about so that that way I can uh, have other chips to play besides money? That's super cool. Vince, I wanted to uh, dive a little on, on some of these topics that you covered in our conference, right? Uh, the trough of disillusionment was something that I've, I had never heard about and really blew my mind. So I'm sure many in the audience would benefit uh, of that. So we were talking about the thing that keeps people from learning new, deep information. And it has to do with this thing called the Dunning-Kruger effect. So the Dunning-Kruger effect is this phenomenon discovered by two social scientists that, that said, how confident are you in what you know? And there's this really interesting graph that um, if you say, how much time have you spent on the, on the horizontal axis? and how confident are you on the vertical axis, then you would think that people would get more confident the more time they've spent studying something. So you think it's gonna be this like linear path, but it turns out that when they studied this across genders, across ages, across um, uh, cultures, everybody has the same effect, which is when you first start learning something, you go from having no confidence in into it to like 90 or 95% confident that you know everything there is to know. So we've all seen this. You watch the person uh, 
read one book or watch one documentary and all of a sudden they're an expert on GMOs or social media networks or whatever's going on, right? And then if you keep reading, you get a little more confident, a little more confident, but then eventually you hit a point where the more you learn, you realize it conflicts with things you thought you already knew. And so now your confidence starts going down. So the more you learn, the less confident you become. And we think about this on like a college campus, right? Because as you keep studying for years and years, you start pummeling down so fast on your confidence about what you know, because you keep finding all the things that are like, yeah, that's true up until a point, but then this and then this exception. So you, you see those PhD students on a college campus that you would think you should be you know, with your head held high and stomping around the campus because you've got so much opportunity to get education when really what they are is in the bottom of the trough of disillusionment, right? They, they don't know when they will ever hit the bottom. Is there ever a time where I will quit learning things that make me feel like I know less and they'll start making me feel like I know more? And the interesting thing is if you keep going for years and years, like you did as a veterinarian or as a nutritionist, eventually you start building your confidence in what you know, and it goes up at a moderated pace as opposed to that giant spike you have when you first learn something. You know, this is a good link for, for the other conversations we had here today, but you mentioned some of these documentaries and I, I brought it up already a few times on the podcast. Uh, some of these, um, yeah, the whole thing around um, plant-based diet and those things. And it's, it's, it's really along these lines of folks watching once and then, but something that I personally struggle, um, Vince, and I want to get your insights is that many of these documentaries, especially when it comes to plant-based diet and other things, uh, they're so well done and so convincing. And sometimes like you mentioned before that the data behind it, it's fairly weak from an overall science standpoint because they're using a lot of observational studies, not so much a randomized type of studies. Boy, I mean, how in the heck does our industry tackle that? I'm still, I know you've answered that a few different ways, but I'm trying to dig a little deeper because it's super complicated topic. Well, I mean, I think that the thing that you should take heart about is if you as an expert ever actually have a chance to talk with somebody and you answer the questions that they have, they feel great, right? You, I, I can't tell you how many times I've been on an airplane where when the mom sitting next to me found out I work for Monsanto, she would like clench her fists, right? She would say, well, I'm trying to buy my kids organic. I'm trying to make it so they don't have pesticides on their food. And that by the time we would be done with that plane ride, she would feel a sense of relief, like let her hands go and let the grip go. So what the way that the activists are doing this is that they are handing people a hero's journey. They're saying, you are the hero if you take this on and know how evil and bad those people are. And they're in, in order to be a hero in the story that, that make the, the agriculture look bad is to take on this gloom outlook in the world. And so I think that agriculture has to figure out when we tell stories, how can we tell stories so that the consumer is the hero and that they're putting down this burden that they should be afraid of everything around them, that they should be afraid of agriculture. And I think that that's going to have to do with making really compelling videos that are not the farmer is the hero, but the consumer that figured out that they were being lied to, or the consumer that figured out that this was a trick is actually the hero. Because without changing who the hero is and who the mentor is, uh, the other side's going to keep out competing you. Wow, that, that makes total sense. For example, yeah, so the consumer being that hero that goes through a farm and say, look, I mean, I don't see any bad, uh, you know, any uh, mis or abuse of animals here. I, I see this diet very well formulated and uh, very well taken care of. It's probably something along those lines. What you're saying. Right. But I think it also has to be more creative than that. Right. Like, you know, if you think about one of the most impactful movies of all time was Aaron Brockovich. I don't know if you were in the States when that movie came out, but that oh. was your listeners. Most of them will have seen this movie. It's with Julia Roberts. And she discovers that the evil energy company is dumping stuff that pollutes water and people got really sick. And because of her class action lawsuit, they won. Right. 
it, it's a really interesting thing to to watch that movie and say why was that so impactful on making people go from being like the energy industry is okay to they're poisoning us and they'll do anything they can to to uh, to stop us and it's because they found a likable hero that they could have put into a drama. And as people were watching it, they could say, I would want to be like Aaron Brockovich. I would want to challenge authority. I would want to push back on what they're doing. So it doesn't have to be just that same show and tell that feels so obvious to farming. It probably is getting involved in cinema. It is getting involved in actual storytelling where your stories are allowing you to reveal something where when you watch the character itself, that's the person that you're trying to be like. Man, uh, I think our industry needs an original Netflix documentary. <laughs> Probably. You know. But it's got to be a good movie. It's got to be one that people watch because it's good to watch and it happens to have the message in it that they need to hear. I think that the outside of the industry has been the activists have been very patient about that. They've, they've been they've been willing to tell the stories that eventually stack up to people making a realization or come to a conclusion that corporations are bad or that farming is bad. And they did it over time. And ag wants to respond by being like, let's just lay this textbook out for you. One plus one equals two. And that's not compelling and interesting. So it has to be compelling and interesting with a message embedded into it, but that that that's the easy way to make the 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 red pill go down. And I think it's not even a fair game a little bit, right? Because uh, bad news spread way faster than good news, right? So so even if we did as good of a job, we'd still be in bad shape. Uh, so we need to be, do a ten times better job, which we are a hundred years away from that, and we need to step up. Yeah, but I mean, I think what you're doing here, right, the, just the very act of trying to get on the edge and trying to do things that are different, one of the things that happens by being an innovative place is that you become a gravity well that pulls in other people that are doing interesting things, that pull in and says, hey, I see your problem and I see the way that I used to have a problem and we can connect those two things. And so as... As, uh, as we see what looks like chaos right now with coronavirus and the, ch the chance to do virtual conferences and the chance to do podcasting in totally different ways, the people that look and say, okay, well, when we get back to normal, we'll go back to fight this fight. Or the other people versus the other people that say, hey, all the rules are different. I'm going to hold a different kind of conference. I'm going to invite the different kind of people. I'm going to interview different sorts of people. You're going to draw in the other types of people that will bring the ideas to be able to make your thing be 10 times or 100 times better. And so I think right now, Marcia, what you're doing with Swinet and the other things that are knocking on because of that will result in the thing that you're looking for. I appreciate it. I think that's a good segue for, for what you had on the event, which was the novelty search concept. Yeah, so novelty search is one of those things that's uh, not intuitive at first. In fact, it's a little bit like a, a paradox where on, on its face, it doesn't seem right. And it was uh, a concept that comes from the artificial intelligence world. In fact, on my podcast, I interviewed a really interesting guy named Kenneth Stanley. And Kenneth uh, did some research on how to make robots walk. And when they were trying to work on this experiment, they spent years, decades saying, OK, the robot should lift its leg up, you know, 0.3 centimeters and then move it at this axis. And then they were trying to make the mathematics replicate the way that humans walked or the way that other bipeds walked. And it wasn't until Kenneth came around and said, well, what if we change up what we're doing? And instead of thinking that the way that we get across this river is by just walking on each of the stones that's right in front of us, because we've not been able to succeed. They couldn't make robots that would walk. They could walk for a few steps and then fall over. He said, why don't we do it a little bit differently? And instead, why don't we let the robot choose to do something new? And then every time it starts to do something with the way it moves, the way it orients itself, once it's done something twice, it doesn't want to do that anymore because it knows it's not going to work. It's just going to keep trying new and novel things. Well, within a few hours of turning on this algorithm, the robot figured out how to readjust its body and walk in any direction. And then they started being able to teach it how to go through mazes and all sorts of other things. And the key, he said, was by not having an objective and instead focusing on 
What is the thing that pulls you? What is the thing that you're like, hey, that's an idea I haven't tried before? And we talked about it in terms of this kind of um, called uh, a term that philosophers have used for a long time called the daemon. And the daemon is the the uh, little voice in the back of your head that says, we should go do that. You know, we should go try that. And even though everybody else around you is like, no, we've already done it. We've tried it a thousand times. No, that won't work. You just keep going with it. And when you follow these things that you're curious about, what you're interested in, eventually you will find something so novel that you'll have a major breakthrough. And the, Kenneth Stanley would say that that's the value of a novelty search. Instead of going in and saying, I'm going to try and figure out how to make swine nutrition do X, Y, or Z. Instead, you're going to say, well, we're going to go explore some things and see if we can figure out what might work that we haven't tried before. I love it. And the first thing that comes to mind is the SpaceX and how much failures they, they, they had until they were extremely successful recently. Yeah. And the, and the process of allowing your group to fail is a difficult one to turn into your culture because you need them to fail forward, you know, kind of falling upwards. But uh, at the same time, you need them to be comfortable with failure and, and to be and to be saying the reason the failure had happened was not because I didn't try hard enough. It was because the idea I had was just too far. So let's figure out some different idea. And that is all about your company culture. Can you create an environment where people can still be successful despite the fact that they've failed a few times? There's that quote uh, that says, fail forward, fail fast, fail often. And I just love it. Awesome, Vince. Uh, another thing, uh, you mentioned your podcast, which is amazing. Everyone should check it out. Vince Crow is the name of the podcast. Um, I, I wanted to know, like, you've interviewed a wide range of folks, right? For you, and you mentioned one story already, but what, what are the other uh, biggest lessons from, from those interviews? So the, the benefit of my podcast, yours is highly specific, right? So people tune in here and they know, well, I want to know about this genre of, of topics around swine. Mine is the inversion of that. It is the, it's the generalist. So I've done everything from interviewing a member of the House of Lords all the way down to interviewing a man that was homeless for five years and spent time in prison. And, uh, and Jackie Joyner Kersey and retired ranchers. And so my goal uh, in these conversations is to figure out really what is the daemon inside of people's minds? What is that little voice that tells you why you should work hard or why you didn't give up or how, what oriented you uh, after you fell down? And so these conversations end up going into wild directions that I would never anticipate. You know, just the other day, I had a guy say, this is what I had to learn in order to be able to have a marriage that lasted for 50 years. And, you know, you really listen to somebody that's telling you the mistakes they made along the way during a 50 year marriage. That that is one of those things that those lessons don't just apply to my marriage or the marriages of everybody in my audience, they actually have all sorts of other wisdom embedded in them that you can think about for other problems in your life. So I take a lot of the lessons that I learned through my podcast and I use those for the to keep my talks really innovative. I give a lot of talks and then I run um, executive retreats for people that, that are saying, hey, we want to get together and and push the envelope. We want to change the way our business is working. We want to get people to work along better. So I'm able to use the wisdom that I get from the podcast uh, into the other areas of my business. I'm really fortunate in that way. Amazing. We all want to know the marriage secret. What is it? <laughs> well, Mike, uh, Mike talked about the uh, humility. He talked about uh, recognizing where your failings were and being very clear uh, with your spouse that, um, it's okay for you to have feelings. Neither of you are perfect, but it, it went way deeper than that. I don't even think I could paraphrase what he's saying. <laughs> I love it. I love it. This is cool. Uh, one other, you're very, um, there's only a handful of people that, that, that maybe five or 10 that I can put on a, on a original thinker type of category. At least when I say five or 10 is on, in, that I know, right? No, not, not like a Elon Musk type of, of, of deal. But in my circle, there is probably five or 10. And you are one of them, right? Original thinker. Um, what is um, something that you truly believe that many people or most people would disagree? Oh, uh, the, I often refer to that as like the Peter Thiel paradox, right? The idea of um, what 
if you don't have an idea that people disagree with, then you probably aren't thinking that originally. One of them that I've been thinking about lately is, um, so I, I talk about St. Louis lives right on the edge of the Mississippi River and across the river is East St. Louis. And East St. Louis is a, is a very broken down place. It's I got high poverty, high murder rate. It's in the state of Illinois. And I often share with people that I think the state of Missouri um, should actively get together money and and probably investment groups should should uh, think about going over and buying the real estate up in in East St. Louis and be prepared for when the state of Illinois hits insolvency and it needs to sell off some things to gain money and we'll be there to offer to buy this thing that is of almost no value to the state of Illinois. They, they, they've written it off. They've left it to be just a shallow, shattered shell of a place. And I believe that that East St. Louis could be um, returned to prominence and have uh, all sorts of manufacturing done there, uh, animal livestock slaughtering and uh, shipping because it's all around the most important waterway in the world. That was one of the the, um, biggest slaughterhouses in the country. And uh, there are people that want to work there. Um, And so I think we ought to do that and be ready for to turn uh, East St. Louis into the Brooklyn of, uh, of St. Louis. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. And, and a lot of people disagree with that. I would say there's almost no one that thinks uh, Missouri should buy the state of part of East St. Louis. Of Interesting. Um, and the other thing you do, you have this little network, right? Uh, if you want to share about that, but I also want to go a little deeper where, it almost feels to me that that's probably kind of the future of social media, meaning less algorithm dictating what you should see or should not see, and also more original, I guess. So what's your thoughts? Yeah, so uh, you're making reference to a thing started from the podcast. So when I during coronavirus, I was doing two, sometimes three podcasts a day about coronavirus, what's going on. And I started having people say, Hey man, I want to support what you're doing. I I interviewed Brad Frecking, who I know you've had on the podcast and it it got 50,000 views and people were like, Hey, you're getting the word out. What can we do to support it? And I didn't want to just say, Oh, I'll accept donations or a Patreon. I wanted to actually create something. So I decided to start a thing called a mighty network, which is a social media platform where people can pay for a membership and then you're hyper specialized in in whatever your group is. So for for the Articulate Ventures Network, I wanted a place where people could go and have discussions about topics where if they tried to do it on Facebook, where there's the tragedy of the commons, anybody can show up, anybody can can talk, uh, that those conversations would always be short circuited. So you wouldn't actually have real conversations where somebody says, I have this perspective about what I see going on in the world, do you see that too? Or people putting up talks that they've given saying, hey, I want real feedback on this. I want you to tell me what you really think or um, people working out different different business models. And so it's a place where people go and they expect that they will get real feedback and that they will get support from the other people in the network, but that you have to be there and be um, interested in the things that other people are trying to build and think about. And so it's just a way for people to connect in a way that social media promised us. We, I think we thought this was gonna be what was gonna happen on Facebook and Twitter, but because they're free, they have not worked out that way. So I now have a membership organization and it's, it's uh, fantastic. Right. I think the free word uh, on this regular social media is where you touch the point. I mean, what's that, that quote from the, the documentary? If you don't know, um, what is it? If you don't know what the product is, you are the product. So it's, <laughs> it, you need to be very careful that, you know, social media with all, you know, all the algorithms and then the ads. Yeah. And, and that's things. an interesting thing. Like the network now, we don't benefit if people are on there angry. We don't benefit if people are on there being really mad and, and upset that somebody didn't understand their point. People are there because they want to be there. So we've created a culture where um, the the when you share things on the social media, you're going to see the content that you want to see. It's not an algorithm trying to drive up emotion. And instead, it's the type of place where you can go to get better or work on different you know, aspects. So it's just very, it's structured. And I think you're right. It's where the, you're paying for it so that that way you are not the product. Right. And you, you touched uh, communication a few times and 
I mean, these days, right, many pig producers doing teleconference with the farm staff um, and also everyone else in the industry. So I know you have some, some very um, good expertise on this topic of uh, just telecommunications. I don't know if that's a word or video conferencing, but also, I also want to touch on communications in general, if you can also give us some insights based on your expertise as well. Well, I think the the most overlooked uh, aspect of video conferencing is people's audio. I think that you know you, you sit there and you think, oh, they can see me, or oh, my lighting's not good, or and those are all things you should probably fix. But if you want people to actually pay attention to your ideas, then you want to take out as much of the noise as you can. So the if you're in a room that has a ton of echo, then you may want to put a carpet down or put some soft things on the wall or put pillows up near you. Um, if you are always sounding far away from your computer, you should get headphones on. Everybody that's on a video conference should always have headphones on, um, if only because those headphones make it so your sound won't bleed back into the microphones. But then, uh, you know, spending the money to get a decent microphone is probably the best investment you can make because all of your ideas are being transmitted through sound. And sound is really touch from a distance. As I blow air into this microphone, it actually is going to shake the, the speakers near you that then move the little hairs in your ear. So I'm touching you with my voice. And if it's modulated through a crappy microphone or just through your computer, you're going to fight to get people to listen to you as much as they should. I love it. I mean, we, um, I've interacted with folks sometimes that there, maybe it's an older computer and the sound is just terrible. And sometimes you can buy like a $10 mic from Amazon, the lapel one, and, and those are, do a pretty good job. Oh, I think uh, Apple's headphones, the ones that you could plug into the computer, now they've changed the connector. But those are probably the highest quality microphone for whatever they are, $29 on, online. And if you don't get knockoffs, if you get a real Apple headset, they are really good. And I'm talking about the wired ones, not the non-wired ones. That's all you need. That is, that is almost as good as what we're getting out of these really high quality microphones. Right. This has been a dry events. A few other things I want to hit on. One is... Um... If you could have something written on a billboard around the globe and um, everyone could see it, what would it say? You are responsible for you. I think that that is one of the most important messages that, that people need to understand. And that's not to say that you're not responsible for anybody else, um, but it's to say that your first responsibility is to get the oxygen mask on yourself, get your room cleaned up. You know, make sure that you are what you can be before you go judging anybody else or doing anything else. Like your love will be bigger if you are responsible for you, your uh, actions, your success, everything will be bigger if you take it on yourself. I love it. And you mentioned the, the airplane type of uh, introduction there when you're taking off. And, and I mean, that's that, that it is. You need to get oxygen first and then help others. And it's amazing. I love it. Vince, um, there's, there are three questions that I ask every guest. One is, um, what's your favorite pig-related book? And you might not have one, but it could be agriculture-related book. Um, I, I think my favorite pig-related book would probably be Charlotte's Web. I don't know, that's, I don't know if you've gotten that one uh, before, yeah, but <laughs> they're probably I mine. I love it. I love it. How about a book not related to agriculture, but it, uh, that it changed your life? Oh, that's a great question. There is a book, the book that comes to mind right away is, uh, is called The Rational Optimist. And it was um, written by a man named Matt Ridley, where he tries to go through and say, how would we know if things are getting better in the world? And he, he takes it as, um, as a contrarian view as he can, where, where he says, you know, maybe, maybe the fact that we're living longer, or we're not living as happily, or maybe we're not. And it was just a very good way for me to, to have some of my preconceived motions um, ripped apart and having to look at the world a different way. The Rational Optimist by Matt Ridley. Does he go along the lines of like, hey, it's, it, 
everything looks like chaos right now, or even before COVID, it also looked like chaos. But uh, the, the question is, it, it almost feel like, uh, I mean, if you look at 10, 20 years ago, we were in pretty good shape, man. Is that the take or? Yeah. And it talks about like the general um, movement, like there's always been regulation or centralization and these things always happen. But that, you know, if you look at how much effort would have been required to have 10 minutes of reading light, you know, if you were back in the colonial times, think about what you're buying. You are buying, uh, you know, 12 men to, to staff a ship that's going to go out into the North Atlantic, get out into a rowboat, go harpoon a whale, bring the thing back on board, cut it open, get the whale oil, and now you can have 10 minutes of, of enough lumens that you can read. Because when you just had fire, you, you couldn't. And so how much work was required to create that? And then how much work would it be required to earn that? Which is, it's about a hundred hours worth of labor um, by those days standards to have 10 minutes worth of reading light. Now, by the time most people have poured their first cup of coffee in their automatic coffee maker, they've made more money on their job to pay for the lumens of them and everyone they know for the entire night. And so it, th that kind of perspective made me say like, okay, you got to really zoom the camera lens back to really understand how are we doing as a civilization? Amazing. I need to check this out. And Vince, the last one is, what do you think sets apart successful professionals from those that are not? Over the long term, it's uh, can you find people that you disagree with, but you still respect? Because I think that most anyone uh, that, that is hardworking and smart and um, you know, tenacious, you'll get to the top. But the challenge of staying at the top comes from uh, constantly encountering ideas that on their face you don't agree with, but that somebody is able to get through to you to allow you to adapt. And I think that that's one of the things that uh, is often overlooked when people are on their way to the top, they forget, I, I have to be really good at making people that disagree with me feel comfortable telling me that they disagree with me. And I think that's one of the most underdeveloped skills that we have in this illusion of conflict world that we live in right now. I think we're spot on. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about a quote that we're, uh, I think we're going to post in our social media. It's from Joe Rogan, the first ever Joe Rogan quote on a pig podcast, uh, social media. But it's, um, if I get it right, it's honest. Um, this agreement uh, has more social value than the dishonest agreement. And I think it's really along the lines of what you're saying, you know. And I think the ag world is uh, particularly susceptible to the vice of dishonest agreement because the ag world you do have to manage your relationships and you there it isn't very big and so we get into this cycle where we think ah i don't want to rock the boat you know this is the way it's always been but over the long term you will be disrupted if you can't find the disagreements that help you change and so that's why you got to make sure that's not too endemic in your culture i love it and i hope anyone listening here we do a little um, get some money to do our original Netflix help in uh, agriculture. I think that uh, that would be a good outcome, Vince. I definitely have ideas on a screenplay. I just don't know who to hand them to. <laughs> uh, awesome. It's been a joy, Vince. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me on. Imagine if with a few key concepts, you could have the potential to create a massive positive impact by bringing from hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars for swine producers. Join us on this small group and go to the next level of swine nutrition on this seven week long elite online training in applied swine nutrition and feeding by myself and my world class invited speakers. Additionally, you enjoy an exclusive community to exchange ideas. Go now to www.eliteswinenutritionist.com.